Hello, welcome everyone to our ICT advisory on the rise of remote work. We are excited to have you with us today and we're gonna go ahead and move forward here. So just to go over our agenda today, we're gonna to start off and do some welcome and introductions to the teleworking project, go over our framing trends with some time for question and answer, as well as our teleworking survey methodology and findings with some time for question and answer for that as well. That will be followed by our panel discussion, which will take us right up to the end there, and we'll have some brief minutes for a conclusion as well. Before we get started, I just wanna thank some of our supporters here. These advisories are sponsored by the Los Rios Community College District with strong workforce funds in conjunction with Yuba, Sierra and Lake Tahoe Community Colleges. These events are also supported by the Capital Region's four workforce boards, which include SETA or Sacramento Works, Golden Sierra Job Training Agency, YOLO Works and North Central Counties Consortium. And with that, I will pass it over to Renee, John, and Valley Vision to get us started. Thank you everyone for joining us today for the Rise of Remote Work. I want to acknowledge the Valley Vision team that has worked hard on this project, especially the creation and distribution of the survey. Um, so you have met Caitlin Blockus already, who has uh, started the event for us. We are Danielle Sousa who was the um, master behind the survey creation and distribution. And we have uh, Angelina Alwini, who is also supporting this event today. And I'm gonna hand it over to Cornelius Brown uh, from the Community College System, Regional Director of Employer Engagement. Hello everybody, Cornelius Brown here, and thank you for attending today. Um, we hope that you find uh, our work meaningful and that you will leave uh, with a curious mind of, you know, where are we taking remote work from here? So thank you and welcome. And now I'd like to introduce Jamie Orr from Orc of Excellence. And they're gonna take us through some trends and framing related to remote work. Great, thank you so much, Renee. Thank you, Cornelius. And thank you to Valley Vision uh, for helping support this project. It's been an absolute pleasure to work with everyone. Um, what I'd like to do today is set up some framing around remote work trends and talk a little bit about the project motivation. So if we can go ahead and go to the next slide, please. So the, the project is preparing students for a remote work future. So obviously the students are the focus here. And what we're doing is we are working uh, hard with the community college system and our regional partners to implement some really uh, effective curriculum and strategies that will take advantage of this remote work future to really prepare our local and regional workforce for this shift to remote work. So some of the project goals um, overall include, you know, identifying some regional workforce trends, remote opportunities, and those include uh, remote opportunities beyond our region for our local workforce, uh, developing and implementing remote worker specific curriculum uh, and integrating that into existing programs. So um, the important part here is that we're looking at um, augmenting existing, especially CTE programs, rather than trying to create something entirely new, no new degrees, no new, no new uh, pathways, but really layering on things we've learned and things that um, are necessary in a remote work future and adding those into our existing programs. And of course, with that, a big piece of that is going to be con continuing to assist faculty with pro professional development around remote work, and then things like we're doing here today around employer engagement. Next slide, please. So a couple things around the project motivation. Um, I want to go over some high level uh, stats and trends around the remote work shift, especially as it pertains to the rapid shift to remote work as a result of the COVID pandemic, some of the challenges and opportunities that arise from remote work, especially for the workforce, and of course, how this all fits together in terms of preparing students and their remote work future. So what we've seen in the past 18 months is a rapid acceleration of a remote work shift. Now, 
This shift was already occurring. However, the COVID-19 crisis has really accelerated the shift and thrown many more people into remote work and distributed teams than wherever before. And what we are seeing now is many, especially large corporations and even smaller companies are doubling down on that rapid shift and saying that they are going to keep remote work policies and strategies as a permanent fixture in their operations. So it's estimated by the Global Workplace Analytics. Now, this is an amazing firm that's one of the uh, at the forefront of kind of flexible work policies and data and watching the trends across the United States that um, their recent study shows that 75 million US employees could work from home. And specifically, this is based on data actually pre pandemic. So what they were what employees were doing in their jobs before the pandemic. They've been studying this number since I think 2002 based on Bureau of Labor Statistics data. And note that importantly, this accounts for 56% of the non self employed workforce. This is a huge number of employees that could have the ability to work from home either full time or several days per week. You're where you're looking at um, not only working remotely or distributed from your colleagues, but on an asynchronous schedule. So it, it's about getting rid of the, the normal nine to five and maybe having different hours based on time zones or things like that. Um, hybrid work is an, another kind of hot topic right now. And what that means is um, that's where you might go into a corporate office two to three days per week or maybe once a month. Uh, and so there's a lot of commercial real estate people that are looking at how to really balance that out in terms of how do you figure out um, who needs a desk and how often, how much space do you need? Uh, does this really help people in terms of the flexibility they're looking for if they still have to live within a reasonable commute distance to their headquarters? Um, I'm not a personally a huge fan of hybrid work, but I think for a, a number of employers and companies, I think that's going to that's going to really be beneficial. Uh, and then there's also the difference between telecommuting and telework. And these are more of the traditional terms that you'll see for remote work. Telecommuting is specific to when you can take work home with you, but you still work primarily at a corporate office. Whereas telework is the remote work. And so telework is gonna be, uh, you know, especially in public agencies and government, that's, that's the primary um, term that's gonna be used, but that is fully remote work and being capable of doing that work remotely from a location that is not your corporate office or your main office. And we're seeing a lot more of these policies being implemented and changes being made in company structure that allows for this type of work to really increase because it really, it really, like I said, is, is a, a big movement. It's not going away. And it's a matter of how do we now leverage this trend to make sure that it really does lead us toward a future of work that's more productive um, and allows our students and our workforce to really take advantage of the opportunities afforded by remote work. Okay, next slide, please. So speaking of the challenges and opportunities. <clears throat> so some of the challenges that we're seeing, like I said, working remotely in a pandemic is not working remotely under normal conditions. Um, so many people that were thrust into remote work as a result of the pandemic had zero remote work preparation. I'm sure many of you on the call were in that situation and possibly are still struggling with that. So making sure that um, incumbent employees in our incumbent workforce feels very well positioned to be productive and take advantage of remote work, I think is an ongoing challenge. But also for our kind of upcoming workforce that is being trained, how do you start a job remotely? You know, our onboarding processes from the employer side, we're also not prepared to onboard employees working remotely. You know, how do you um, kind of get yourself into fitting into a team when it's a remote team? How do you look for a remote job? You know, all of those things are definitely challenges that we need to look at and try to make sure we can prepare students and our workforce for <clears throat> because the opportunities are huge. So you have a broader range of job options. You all of a sudden are not geographically constrained to the job opportunities within a, you know, a 30 minute to hour and a half commute. Please don't commute an hour and a half. That's terrible. I, I want to get rid of those. Um, 
but especially for our like secondary and our rural economic regions, so Tahoe being included, all of a sudden that opens up a lot of job opportunities that are not necessarily localized to that region, which then brings in indirect economic benefits to those rural and secondary regions, because that income from a higher wage or possibly remote job then benefits that that local community. Um, flexibility is huge, and, in, and I'm actually going to add autonomy to this. Um, if you have caretaking or family responsibilities, having a flexible or remote job can allow you to be more gainfully employed and less underemployed than uh, what a lot of localized job opportunities can afford. And also for workers with disabilities, we've seen this as a huge boon for um, veterans that possibly have PTSD and cannot go on transit to a job because that triggers anxiety and other issues that affect productivity. Again, having the opportunity and the autonomy to choose a, do a job that's remote or flexible and allows you to work in an environment that allows you to be productive is a huge opportunity that we really need to make sure that we take advantage of. Next slide, please. <clears throat> and so really what this comes down to is we need to commit to having our educational systems address remote work. And this is not something that we saw was being done prior to the pandemic, during the pandemic, and really is not being done yet. So we're doing it. So we want to make sure that we are looking at and adding into the educational systems um, any additional competencies that are particular, but particularly beneficial to remote work. Uh, helping our workforce find and interview for remote jobs. The interview process as a result of a remote workforce has completely changed. So we need to make sure that we are preparing our workforce for that <clears throat> so they can get hired for those remote jobs, get onboarded well, uh, and then be successful working and thriving in positions uh, from wherever they are. So that includes things like you know, work-life balance if you are needing to separate, if you do work from home, for example, how to set up um, effective workstations and work on time management, all of these things that uh, really will help our workforce take advantage of this new future of work. Go ahead. And so now I'd like to turn it over and take that from kind of a high level trend view and, and hand it over to Aaron Walter, who's been looking at uh, remote work in the labor market and some trends, both localized and nationally. So thank you and take it away, Aaron. Good morning, everybody, and um, thank you, Jamie. Thanks to the Valley Vision team. And um, I am gonna be talking a little bit about um, data analysis that we've done supporting this project uh, from the jobs postings um, uh, software that we have access to. Let me just briefly introduce myself. Um, the program that I work for, the Centers of Excellence, is a project of the California Community College's Economic and Workforce Development Division, um, and we provide um, research services and other kinds of technical assistance to the community colleges and other community partners, really looking at the jobs picture uh, for investment strategy. So um, the data that I'm going to be showing you today comes from a tool that we use called Burning Glass. And Burning Glass um, is basically um, uses an algorithm that counts keywords in jobs postings uh, across a range of jobs boards like Monster and Indeed. And as you'll see, the software enables us to ask um, specific questions for trends in industries and job titles, uh, prominent employers and occupations, so forth. So in this case, um, we use this search criteria that pulled jobs postings that contained um, one or more keywords related to remote work. So that would have been stuff like work from home or remote or telecommute that popped up in the jobs postings. What I wanna mention here today, there's a lot of great reasons to use Burning Glass, uh, what's called real, real time labor market data. Um, it's just one data source, so the kinds of interpretations I, I make here are evading uh, like a mixed methods approach. And so every data source, of course, has its strengths and weaknesses. In this case, um, not everything about uh, what's needed for a job is going to make it into the jobs postings through like the HR department. So it's entirely possible that uh, the amount of remote work uh, included in jobs postings as we're going to look at them is, a, is quite more prevalent than what we're able to interpret. 
nonetheless, the general trends are really kind of what's interesting here, and you'll see that. Um, so let's go on. I think we're on the, the slide here. Jobs postings work from home in California. And um, each one of these uh, looks that we are doing um, basically distinguishes a geography criteria. So we're going to look at uh, here in these first slides, California compared to greater Sacramento region compared to the nation. Um, when I say greater Sacramento region, I'm referring to uh, the seven counties uh, around um, the city of Sacramento. So here looking at these jobs postings, I'm not totally paying attention to the absolute number, but the general trend here, um, of course, we're looking at um, the jobs postings that refer to remote work in uh, across uh, industry sectors here that you see on the bottom. And just to give you a sort of an idea, so finance and insurance is the industry that has uh, the most number of jobs postings related to remote work. But just to give you an idea here, um, all industries uh, in the jobs postings mention, that mention remote work, um, that is a minority share by a lot. So finance and insurance that has the most number of remote work jobs postings, that number 29,000, that's still only about 11% of all the postings in uh, the finance and insurance industry sector. So um, when you talk about like utilities, for example, the shares are really small. I just want to make that make that clear. Nonetheless, uh, you know, just based on what I just said, that's not necessarily true. Uh, we're just kind of looking at the trends here to give us something to kick against. So this uh, slide is referring to a one year period. So we're comparing two years. We're comparing a one year period ending March 31st, uh, 2020 versus the period um, ending March 31st, 2021. So basically looking to see what the impact from COVID was uh, compared to the previous year. We're looking at California here. Um, as we just mentioned, finance and insurance is the clear leader um, that industry more than doubled the number of jobs postings that mentioned remote work uh, from one year to the next, showing the impact of COVID. Healthcare and social assistance is prominent. Uh, didn't really increase the number of remote work postings in California between the two years, um, but it did when we looked at Greater Sacramento and nationally, there was a significant increase. Professional and scientific and consulting services, another leader uh, here, nearly doubled the number of remote work postings. Other interesting trends in manufacturing also doubled the number of postings. Educational services um, shows a significant increase, um, though the numbers are not really that large. So I'll just wrap up this slide by um, uh, mentioning a question, I think what Jamie's kind of driving at here partly comparing. Uh, so if you look at the industries here that have a large number of postings uh, mentioning remote work, and then those industries that don't have many at all take like agriculture, forestry, fishing, and hunting, you sort of start to ask the question, you know, why certain industries have remote, a large number of remote work postings and why others don't. And we can keep asking that question when we look at occupations and skills. Um, next slide, please. Um, so this slide is just showing the greater Sacramento region. This is the same analysis uh, comparing those two years. Um, and the trends are generally the same, although I'll just point out, um, if you look at um, healthcare and social assistance, the number of postings in uh, the most recent year that we looked at due to COVID, um, that number went up. Next slide. Uh, now we're looking at the uh, national picture and the trend is essentially the same. Uh, next slide. So here uh, we're comparing these three geographies, Greater Sacramento, California, and the nation uh, for the number of jobs postings mentioning remote work. 
And this is an annual trend. So again, looking at a 12 month period, in this case, it's ending in January each year through January, 2021. And Here's what's interesting here is kind of my interpretation again of this um, one data point. Um, the trend for a large, larger number of jobs postings, that is an increase in the number of remote work uh, postings mentioning remote work, had a steady increase really starting in 2016 in Sacramento region and California. At the national level, the increase started a little earlier. It was like around 2014. So one possible way to read this uh, data, this uh, trend line, is that COVID is kind of merely accelerating a trend that was already happening. Again, this is just sort of one data set, one data point, but um, you know, like especially if you look at California, the spike was way before COVID. Um, looking at the spike here for uh, the period of ending in January 2018, and then that's almost more significant than what you're seeing um, closer uh, to COVID. So uh, one way to think of this and definitely invite interpretation from others is that COVID just accelerated something that's already going on. Next slide, please. So now we kind of get into the specific looks here around employers and occupations and skills. So this tool is really powerful in that sense. We can kind of look at keywords um, showing up in the postings in different ways. So here um, we're going to look at just two geographies and not the national picture. Uh, and in this case, we're looking at greater Sacramento region. Um, this is a one year period uh, ending March 31st, 2021. And these are the top employers posting that had uh, keywords in their postings related to remote work and then the number of postings uh, for that year. And so, you know, this is really reflecting the industries that we saw on the first slide. So the top employers are in insurance. We see assurance in Prudential, in healthcare, Anthem Blue Cross, and United Health, and then professional and technical consulting like ICF International and then Siemens in the manufacturing uh, sector. Next slide. Uh, so just, uh, you know, same look, top employers, but looking from California, um, really similar employers, similar trends. Uh, one thing, and Jamie pointed this out, is like, in a way, this kind of turns this analysis on its head because the geography of posting may or may not really reflect where you have to be based, where the posting is based. I mean, this kind of uh, defies what how we might interpret this. Um, a posting showing up in California or greater Sacramento uh, may or may not be based there. It's something we haven't really contended with interpreting this data yet. But in, at any rate, when we um, do the criteria poll for California, we get a lot of the same employers um, adding um, Gilead, a biotech company, and a couple of in, uh, educational services companies. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so here we're diving into occupations. So those um, uh, types of jobs that are showing up uh, related to remote work. And um, this slide is related to greater Sacramento region, um, the postings uh, containing remote work uh, type of keywords. Um, so some of this, again, reflects uh, the prominent industries and employers. So the top mention is insurance sales agents. Further down, you get loan officers from the financial services industry. Uh, but here, you know, you're seeing a lot of general cross-cutting type of occupations. Sales agents and managers, customer service reps, software developers, um, general types of managers, and then one occupation related to um, healthcare management, and then nursing, uh, potentially reflecting, you know, a trend towards telehealth, uh, and then uh, um, several technology and computer related occupations. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so again, same look here, um, top occupations in the jobs postings in California, 
um, and very similar top occupations, um, insurance sales agents, software develop developers and, and, and sales. Uh, next slide. So this is my last slide. This is um, another slice on a variation on a theme looking at the top skills that showed up in the postings in the greater Sacramento region, uh, showing keywords related to remote work. And um, here, uh, some reflect the top occupations, others are more general. So again, sales and customer service, um, sales for insurance, uh, and then we get uh, skills related to project management and general management, uh, things like budgeting and scheduling, staff management. Um, there is a mention of HIPAA down lower for the healthcare industry. So I'll just sort of leave you with, um, I think, uh, some of the main themes already uh, brought to the fore here and that Jamie mentioned. So just question for consideration. I mean, if you're thinking about um, occupations and skills, how are these the same or different in a remote work environment? I think that's the, the, the jury's out. We're going to address it today. You know, how do you sell in a remote environment? And how do you manage projects or teams in a remote work environment? So um, with that, I am, my uh, piece is, has wrapped up, I think. So um, thank you all very much and um, look forward to the discussion. Thank you. And before we go to the next section, are there any questions for Jamie or Aaron? I do see some conversation in the chat about jobs related to public administration and thinking there might have been more in the remote work category there. But I also see answers coming in from Daniela and others kind of contributing to the conversation in the chat. So hopefully you're all monitoring the chat and, and seeing that conversation. If you have specific questions, though, if you want to raise your hand, uh, or place it in the chat, we can elevate that now, or we will continue for the next part of our presentation. Okay. Um, we will... I, oh, uh, Renee, and... I, I, so Devin and Mark asked questions um, about specific industries. I think I'm sort of going through this. Um, looks like Jamie responded. Uh, I, I guess I would just say, from our end for the specific analysis that um, uh, we didn't necessarily conduct. We have the ability to do that with this tool. Like, so in the case of manufacturing or public sector employers, those are areas where we have the potential to dive in more, um, uh, but we didn't do that analysis for this particular uh, application. Thank you. Great. And the next part of our presentation is on the remote work survey, the methodology and findings. So I will briefly talk about how we uh, distributed the survey. And then uh, Danielle, who was the master of the survey for Valley Vision, uh, will provide the results for everyone here. So um, this is us. And again, Danielle was really the lead on this uh, project. I wanted to share that um, we created the questions uh, with a combined team of Jamie or Cornelius Brown, Aaron Wilcher, uh, and myself and Danielle, along with um, Evan Schmidt, who uh, prior to being the CEO of Valley Vision was our director of research. And then we, uh, we created the survey to be five minutes or less for employers to complete. And then it was distributed through the Metro Chamber, along with um, the ethnic chambers and other smaller jurisdiction chambers, some professional organizations, and also distributed through the Institute for Local Government to ensure we had public sector representation. Um, and, and I'll hand it over to Danielle to take us through the findings. Thank you, Renee, and good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Danielle Sousa, as she said, <laughs> and I'm a project associate with Valley Vision. Um, thank you so much for logging on this morning. Um, I'm incredibly excited to share the results of our remote work survey with you all. Um, and so looking at our first slide here, the following data is based on a sample pool of 138 responses. And of these 138, um, this is the distribution of participants across industries. And so as y'all can see, there is a wide range of spaces represented here. Um, we have transportation, manufacturing, 
construction, social services, healthcare, government agencies, and nonprofit organizations. Um, now, of course, there's also a really big other section here as well. So lots of spaces here. And this data just shows that the conversation about remote work is prevalent across many sectors. Um, next slide, please. And here are the counties where these organizations are. Um, the counties that participants could choose from were Amador, Alpine, Calaveras, Calusa, um, El Dorado, Glen, Nevada, Placer, Sacramento, San Joaquin, Solano, Stanislaus, Sutter, Yolo, and Yuba. So um, as this graph here shows, our responses came from Yolo, Sutter, Nevada, El Dorado, Placer, and Sacramento. And there's this little yellow section here, which is actually a response from Alpine, um, which is good. And we wanted to focus on these counties specifically to ensure that this data paints a picture that is relevant to our local needs and trends. Um, next slide, please. Um, and here is the organization size of our respondents. Um, we gave our participants five buckets to choose from. Uh, so here you can see one to 25, 26 to 50, 51 to 100, and then it kind of jumps up from there with um, 150 to 500 and 500 plus. And so as this chart shows, um, half of our data does come from organizations that are on the smaller side, so one to, one, one to 25 employees. Um, but there is data here that is applicable to organizations that are larger. We were actually quite surprised by the amount of responses that came from orgs that were 501 plus, um, but it's really exciting just because it shows that there is a lot of different workspaces that this can be applied to. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, and so the next two slides asked about workplace structures. Um, so this is showing question four where we asked respondents to indicate which structure best describes their current workplace. Um, respondents were able to choose between three different options. So here we have fully remote, fully in-person, and a mix of in-person and remote. And so as you can see here, the majority are a mix of in-person and remote, which makes sense because it reflects the rapid changes that had to happen in response to the pandemic. Uh, next slide, please. And then in question five, we asked respondents to estimate what their work structure might look like within the next 12 to 24 months. Um, the possible options were fully in-person, fully remote, a mix of in-person and remote, and the workforce model we are using is ideal for a four-hour organization, um, which means that no change they believe is necessary. Um, as this chart shows, respondents estimated that over 75% of their workforce will remain on a hybrid schedule 12 to 24 months from now. So this is just like, that was like a, a future look at what they had said their current workforce structure was. And then as for question six, which is shown here, we asked if your business or organization plans on transitioning to a different structure, what obstacles do you anticipate will arise? Um, so this question allowed for multiple answer choices, and our main goal here was to identify additional concerns that our participants think about when considering changes to how their workplace operates. Um, so the options, options shown here were mental health of employees, physical health of employees, COVID-19 guidelines and regulations, cost of equipment and or workspace, legal or contractual requirements, productivity issues, need for additional staff training and other. And so here you can see just like the different headspaces that our respondents were in when thinking about, you know, what kind of issues might come up if we wanted to say, move toward the structure that allowed for more remote work or maybe um, almost fully remote. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this slide is basically describing questions seven, eight and nine in the survey. Um, where we asked participants to use a sliding scale to estimate the following. Um, so the first question was um, to estimate the percentage of employees who worked partially or fully remote during the pandemic. The second question was um, to estimate the percentage of employees you anticipate will work partially remote or on a hybrid schedule 12 to 24 months from now. And then the third prompt was to estimate the percentage of employees you anticipate will work fully remote 12 to 24 months from now. 
Um, so our respondents indicated that 64% uh, of employees had worked partially or fully remote during the pandemic. Um, they also indicated that they estimated 46 of these 46% of these employees to work partially remote 12 to 24 months from now. And 20% of these employees will work fully remote in that same time frame. So this data shows that remote work is anticipated to remain relevant in the months to come. And that we really need to think about what changes need to happen in order to be prepared for that trend. And then in this slide, question 10, um, we had asked, what business or organization functions have changed for your company as a result of the pandemic? And folks were able to choose from the following options. Um, changes to staff supervision practices, uh, fewer staff or client meetings, more staff or client meetings, changes to product or service creation, changes to product or service delivery, uh, changes to staff communications, changes to talent sourcing, changes to contracting and outsourcing and other. Um, respondents were also able to choose more than one answer choice here and you can see the distribution of our responses. And so let's see, changes to staff communications um, in our next slide was um, indicated to be, oh, sorry, in the previous one, were indicated to be the one that would change permanently even after the pandemic, which I believe you can see through the software that has been adopted to increase staff communications in the remote workspace. Okay, and then in the next slide, question 12, we asked participants to think about how much more difficult has hiring or onboarding staff been since the start of the pandemic? So of the responses here, um, they were able to choose much more difficult, somewhat more difficult, not at all more difficult and not sure slash not applicable. And if respondents were to choose the two options that were much more difficult or somewhat more difficult, then they were brought to the next question, um, question 13, where we asked about um, what challenges presented itself while hiring and onboarding. And so here, um, the, quest, uh, the options that we supplied were lack of candidates, virtual etiquette, um, internet connectivity, distribution of equipment and supplies, and other. And so here you can kind of see what respondents were thinking about when thinking about the changes that had to be made with hiring people in the virtual workspace because no longer are in-person um, interviews the norm anymore. And so what can we do to make that process easier on our employers? And then the next slide. Here um, in questions 14 and 15, we asked respondents, what new technological tools has your business or organization adopted during the pandemic? Um, and here we listed a wide range of programs that have grown in popularity since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, so here you can see communication tools like Slack and Microsoft Teams, um, virtual meeting software like Zoom or Google Meet, um, live interactive polling like Mentimeter or Direct Poll, um, document clouds like Google Drive and Microsoft 365. And then you also have project management tools like Asana or Basecamp. And then question 15 um, basically asked with these same answer choices, which ones do you believe you're going to continue to use even after the pandemic? And so here you're able to see just which programs might be valuable in thinking about um, for future like training courses maybe, um, or just programs that could be implemented into workspaces to make remote work more productive. All right. And so question 16 was kind of a big question um, because it was a short answer choice. And so we asked respondents to respond to, um, to give us a short answer to what new practices are you adopting to support your remote or hybrid teams? Um, and so there was a plethora of deep and well thought answers. Um, but here are just a few of the common trends that we identified when analyzing the data. Um, so participants discussed the increased use of online collaboration tools, so more software, um, additional staff training and engagement, which we believe is really important, especially since um, when we're all looking at each other, um, just through our webcams, you kind of lose that like personal touch that you sometimes get when being in a physical space with people. Um, there's also encouraging work-life balance. Um, now that the commute to work makes um, your transition from work to home not so clear, as that's not really a thing anymore. Um, 
There's also regular and increased one-on-one -on -one meetings and check-ins, um, acquiring appropriate equipment, um, as remote workspaces require a lot of technology, <laughs> and understanding that flexibility is essential in these turbulent times. Um, and so that was like the final question in our survey besides the contact information. And we really hope that this survey captured the first of many stories that we're seeing in this region in regards to remote work. Um, but of course, this is only the beginning um, and this data still has more to tell. And so we really need to analyze what we can to truly see how these trends are going to affect our counties and our workforces. Um, and so a final data report will be compiled at a later date, but please feel free to ask any questions either in the chat or in an email. But yeah, thank you so much for your time. Um, thank you, Danielle. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> if anyone has any questions, you can raise your hand now or you can uh, put the question in the chat. I saw some comments about the lack of candidates being interesting. And I did have uh, someone who previewed this information asking, are the lack of candidates because of their remote work positions or are they lack of candidates overall? And we don't know the answer to that for sure, but suspect that it's a lack of candidates overall. All right, I'll give a last call for questions. I'm just looking around to see if there's any hands up or any questions about the survey findings. Okay, well, you, you're a very easygoing group this morning. We are going to move next to our panel. So let me bring that up here. And I will hand it over to Jamie Orr, who's gonna be facilitating our panel discussion. Great, thank you, Renee. <clears throat> so, um, as you know, as part of this, and as part of, I think the the critical piece of really um, keeping in tune with our regional employers, uh, we wanted to gather uh, some representative employers and workforce people from the region to really uh, chat with us about the survey and about remote work, and kind of get a temperature check on on how things are now and how things. Um, they think things are going. So I'm really excited for this stellar panel. Um, I, I do wish we could be all in person together because I really just want to give everybody hugs again. <laughs> but uh, I think this is a really great way again, for especially around a, a teleworking and remote work panel discussion to bring bring together um, this group. So <clears throat> um, we have a series of questions. And so how I will run this is um, I will try to uh, address each person. Um, we'll kind of take turns, but might have specific questions for specific uh, panelists. And um, if you do have questions throughout the panel, please feel free to put those into chat. Um, the Valley Vision team and myself will also kind of be monitoring chat as as we go through this. But really, this is this is the most important piece of of this meeting. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and dive in. Is there a way? To, can we leave the the panelist slide up? so that it's easy so people can also address specific panelists if they have questions. Thank you, perfect. Okay, um, so uh, the first question we have is just a general introduction um, of each of our panelists. So I'm gonna ask each one and I'll, I'll call on you uh, to provide just kind of a, a brief introduction of your organization, um, your role at your organization, um, kind of the background, so basically the number of employees, and then also uh, kind of what the current status is, um, how many are working uh, in office hybrid or fully remote uh, right now. So let's go ahead and start with Nicole Grady from Breathe California. Good morning. All right, so I'm Nicole Grady from Breathe California. I'm the executive assistant and office manager. So we have 14 people working at our company. Um, we're in a hybrid schedule right now, but most people are working from home most days of the week. We're still working on that transition. Um, also, uh, Breathe California is a lung health and air quality nonprofit organization, so we're pretty small. Great. Thank you, Nicole. All right. Sandra with County of Sacramento. Good morning. Um, I'm Sandra Pichelle, and I'm a human resources manager at the County of Sacramento. I oversee training, organizational development, and countywide recruitment. 
Uh, Sacramento County has over 12,500 uh, full-time uh, positions. So we're a large organization. We have over 40 departments and offices within uh, the county. So we have a lot of, uh, we have a variety of positions. So um, uh, I, we don't kind of track how many people are uh, working remotely overall. There was a point in time um, where it was about 20% because we have a lot of departments that provide services to the community where they have to physically show up to work, like transportation, probation, uh, hum, uh, human assistance, animal care. Um, folks have to kind of show up uh, um, to work. But here in our office in employment, employment services, 100% of our folks are working remotely. Um, Presently, we, we've begun returning to work, so our staff uh, come into the office once a week. Great, thank you. <clears throat> All right, Michelle. Good morning, everybody. I'm in a life insurance agent at New York Life. And as you guys can see in the, uh, in the graphs earlier, there's a lot of uh, life insurance agents that's on the rise. So um, I think primarily for that, it's because, you know, it's a sales job and it, even before COVID, it was already remote. So uh, in my office alone, we have um, like 150 agents, but um, that's just covering just the, the Sacramento area. So um, I've been with New York Life for four years and I've, um, I'm just mentoring a lot of new agents that are coming in and that's about it. Great, thank you, Michelle. And Daniela? Yes, um, I'm uh, Daniela Devitt from California Employers Association. Um, I oversee the training and workforce division of uh, California Employers Association. We provide um, HR services support uh, for our members, which we have about 900 members, and we serve over 15,000 employers throughout the state of California. So our um, organization, which is that represents uh, employers throughout California has always had remote work as part of our program for we have about 25% that are fully remote. And since the pandemic, we have moved to a hybrid situation for about 60% of our workforce and then some of our office staff uh, are full time in in the office that's about uh, roughly about 10%. Uh, and with that though, we recognize there is um, an advantage to certain positions that allow them to work remotely. Uh, what we um, have done for our on-site people is more flexible time or we give half day Fridays off where the executive team comes in and covers the phone and doing things like that to, to make it a little bit more equal. But I'm, I'm also gonna say, and I, and I wear kind of a hat that represents the employers that we serve. This has been a very hot topic. Um, part of what my team does is recruiting. And so we have seen that talent shortage. By the time they come to us, they've usually tried all other resources and um, we look to help them recruit in this environment. And, and it's been challenging. And uh, many small business employers, and um, I think sometimes this is generational, that they're resistant to wanting to let their staff work remotely. And a lot of managers are feeling that way. It's, it's out of sight, they're not working. They're not used to shifting it to project work and accountability metrics on what they do rather than the time they sit in a chair. So we work very hardly, hard with these employers. Yeah, and, and that's something that, that I've seen a lot too is, is especially on the management side, there, there is you know, a shift from presenteeism to you know, other accountability metrics. Uh, it does seem to be one of the shifting dynamics that's really critical with remote work. Um, I'm gonna kick it back to uh, Nicole because that actually is a perfect segue into the next question, which is, um, you know, for your team and in your experience, you know, how has, has the shift to remote work changed the dynamics of, of the business? Yeah, so we were not, 
we didn't have anything in place for a work from home policy before. So it's been a huge change in work life balance, actually. Um, we didn't have the right technology in place before, but now we have a remote setup. Most of us have this setup at home and some of us also have this setup at work, depending on an admin level job that you might have at the office. Um, I did see Microsoft on their SharePoint um, on a previous slide. We started using that. That's been pretty cool. Um, we still are getting a remote work policy in place. Um, we went through a STACOG pilot program, um, but we're still developing that. So that's been interesting. Great. So it sounds like some some good changes that are that are going to be uh, kind of a permanent feature, you know, for, for you. Yeah, I'd say we benefited actually from <laughs> this situation. That's great. Um, and then to, to Sandra with the, you know, County of Sacramento. So, you, you know, you commented on obviously a lot of, of public employee positions um, have to be face to face. Um, however, have you seen some of the dynamics change as a result of remote work? Do you think, and do you think some of those are going to be permanent changes? Um, either specific think, to your department or, or to, the, to the rest of the employee base? Yes, I, I believe that um, we will continue in a hybrid model. We had a policy in place um, and um, we kind of tweaked the guidelines because this was a little different and folks were new, a lot of folks were new to uh, remote working. So um, I think that we'll, we'll continue in that in that vein, but also um, yesterday, uh, or I, I think it was yesterday, um, on Tuesday, actually, our um, climate action plan was uh, released. Um, it's, um, it's a draft, but it does include a change to the employee transportation program, which um, the imp implementation goal is to have 30% of uh, employees work hours remote to help, um, you know, help with the climate. So um, having that as a goal um, tells me that we're going <laughs> to kind of focus on that hybrid uh, remote um, and remote work. So um, it's exciting. It's exciting to hear. That's great. And again, yeah, hearing that the, the remote work policy is kind of is being tweaked and created and shifted as a result of the experience. Um, I think that 30% target is fantastic. That's really exciting to hear and that, you know, that's something we have not talked about in, in this context, but it is definitely a, a key topic of discussion around remote work is the environmental benefits to lower vehicle miles traveled and, you know, reduction of energy use if, you know, if you can do that based on commercial office properties and things like that. I know the state of California is also looking at a, a remote work policy with some of those similar targets as well. So that's, that is good news. Um, and then to Michelle with, with, you know, New York Life, you said, you know, a lot of uh, your work was remote before, uh, just on, based on the nature of, of insurance. Um, have you seen anything that has changed? I mean, obviously, we, we saw in the, the job postings that it was definitely a lot more job postings around insurance and finance were included. Is that something that you've been seeing as well as a result of this shift? Yeah, so uh, like I was saying uh, before, um, the the hiring uh, the work the nature of sales has been the same since before COVID. You're kind of on your own and you manage your own book of business. So uh, whoever people ever like started in insurance or sales had to learn how to manage that beforehand. So um, it wasn't as attractive, so to say, because you know you, you're not you don't really ever turn off your your work mode. So when COVID came along. I feel that people had to shift anyways. And so more people were inclined to try insurance because you are going into that mode anyways. So um, it didn't change too much for me because I was already in it beforehand, but seeing the, the challenge of people learning how to do it is um, sometimes kind of sad, but it takes a lot of training. But I mean, we had to train beforehand too. And, and that's why a lot of salespeople will read books and stuff because it's just a whole mindset shift. Absolutely. Great. And then Daniela from the, from especially the, the employers that you're representing or that you assist with, um, have you been seeing uh, kind of a dynamic shift 
in in their business and and you know you, you mentioned that there's a little bit of reluctance especially from um some of the more you said generational period but the experience <laughs> yeah, your experience but also experience like especially... leaders, uh, might have a, a bit of a challenge you know i i uh, i think um and even for us when we went fully remote the need for that remote work policy had to be tightened up we needed to look at the equipment that we supplied we needed to look at the the individual situation i mean we had not considered before uh, when schools were out, how that changed uh, the work day for some of our um, our employees and um, managers. So there there were lots of considerations, and then we took that uh, process and um, uh, gave it to our members and and to employers that needed help. We had a hotline, but we also had remote policies. We helped de develop them, and then we had to shift all of our trainings. Uh, like many of you in the, in the college world, to uh, virtual, and we did that within within months of uh, within a month, I think, of the pandemic, um, and learning all those tools, and then mastering the tools so that we could then uh, help our employers, and also on employee engagement. So there was a, just a whole. If you talk about the changes within our our, our membership, they were huge. And it was constant. Our phones um, have the highest in in the last 20 years of uh, calls during this period of time and needs for assistance. So we actually worked longer and harder during during the pandemic um, in trying to help everyone make this shift. Uh, and we're and some of them did it very very well. Others other employers were struggling, and of course, then the essential workers were just dealing with the COVID issues and and how to keep their uh, employees safe. So we had all of those things coming in, into that picture. Do you think that the especially the remote work policies? Do you think those are going to be permanently uh, adopted? <clears throat> yeah, and more and more of our employers did find out being forced into this that the productivity didn't go down. Um, and, and with that, they're just having to shift how they manage. And that is more of a training issue than, um, than, a, than an issue. But you have to look at the individual people. Some people need that interaction of being in the office and seeing other people. Other people do very, very well working remotely and they're more disciplined, you have to take a look at your workforce as a whole, which is why the hybrid situation can work so well for many of the employers. That's fantastic. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. So the the next question, and again, this is a good a good segue is um, for these hybrid and remote positions, you know, have have skills changed, you know, so you know, we, we're, this is actually a really good spread of, of teams and perspectives that we have on this panel um, to talk about how different industries and kind of different size teams and employers um, have been impacted and are thinking about changing it. So if we're looking at someone that is now applying for uh, a position in this new workforce, and specifically if they're applying for either a hybrid or remote position, you know, has there been a noticeable skills change um, that is going to be needed and maybe kind of bumped up the list of priorities for these candidates? So um, once again, we'll, we'll go through our panel on this. So Nicole, um, you talked a lot about, uh, you know, some of the collaboration tools that your team has implemented. You know, do you feel that, you know, if you were to bring on someone new to your team or if you have through this, you know, are there specific skills that you are now paying more attention to uh, than prior to this remote work shift? I would say it would definitely help to have good time management skills and flexibility. Um, of course, when you hire someone, you always want them to be doing what they're supposed to be doing, but it might be harder to keep track of that um, when they're working remotely. Uh, so we've, you know, we've set up things where we could check in more with employees. Um, I would also say maybe being technologically savvy <laughs> would be pretty helpful. You can teach that stuff, of course, but it's easier to get it down when you already kind of know the technology that you're using. 
And you said you're specifically using uh, the, the Microsoft platform? Yeah, Zoom, Microsoft, it's mostly those. Yeah, and were you familiar with them prior to this shift? I was not. <laughs> you on the job, yep. <laughs> Great, thank you. Yeah, uh, Sandra, what are what are you seeing in terms of you know is there um, a specific focus that has shifted in terms of hiring and and what skills you're looking for in candidates when you when they're being interviewed or in terms of when jobs are being posted? Um, we haven't really changed our postings as of yet, but um, the skills that we kind of look for um, right now, I'm looking for um, an office specialist. So um, generally they would support, physically support uh, the trainers, but they're going to do it virtually. So I'm looking for uh, digital literacy um, because we do use uh, a training platform. Um, we do it virtually real time, as well as um, through our learning management system. Also, um, looking for someone with um, a high degree of self-management so that they can, um, you know, organize their work, prioritize, um, and also um, um, motivate themselves to, to uh, focus on the work. Also, communication. Um, we communicate in so many different ways now, and the communication is different because, you um, we're virtual. So a lot of the cues that we would get in person, we don't get. So um, those are the things that I'm looking at right now. And just the platforms, the various platforms we use for recruitment now at virtual, they just really have to have that savvy to, to learn them and learn them pretty quickly. I've seen at least one kind of one study that was showing the a change in hiring practices around um, like specifically kind of initial candidate packets and um, the importance of that initial cover letter has changed and I was just really curious if that's something that that you've seen um, and specifically the shift being the cover letter was always it has been thought of as kind of a formality as just part of a candidate packet but including personal touches and stories and having a much more uh, comprehensive cover letter has actually become more important again. Is that something that you're seeing? Um, yes, um, I, and I'm looking more closely at it. Um, okay. I'm looking for, for certain things. So I, it's, it's, it is very helpful to have a more comprehensive cover letter. And we do request that, a letter of interest in, uh, and a cover letter. So. Yeah, I just I thought that was a, a, an interesting specific kind of point in terms of how some of some HR policies and practices have changed as a result. Um, Michelle, so you've you've talked about again in terms of you know the the independence and time management and sales positions um, even pre pandemic were really important. Um, are there is there anything else that has become even more important as a result of the pandemic that you're seeing uh, for people that are wanting to jump into insurance, or is it still pretty much like you said, people are now uh, more willing to try and are, are more likely to kind of jump into your field. Do we have Michelle? I forgot to unmute myself, I'm sorry. It's okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> I would say drive would be really important um, in this industry just because, you know, it's 100% commission. So you can't sit there and say you'll listen to somebody or do what you guys want and just be able to get paid. So um, a lot of people are trying it just because they're already in that freedom space. Um, so basically just drive and being able to push through because there's a the freedom of doing business however you want. There's some people that, you know, only do phone calls all day. There's people that uh, do get business through social media. And then some people are still doing the old fashioned way of just doing the networking out and about. So um, it just really uh, comes down to their drive. Fantastic. And then Daniela, is there anything that you're seeing in terms of, you said you've been hurt, you've been helping a lot with, with recruitment um, for your employers. You know, has there been a, a shift in what skills are highlighted in order to, to find priority candidates? Yeah, I, um, so if, um, if they're going to be working remotely, they are looking for experience in working remotely, their ability to uh, analyze data and work independently. Project management skills are all on the top of that list. Um, and, and also resilience. 
I mean, th th that adaptability, that flexibility, just being able to um, roll with the changes because that's been the name of the game for businesses this year. We, we don't know what the next few months are gonna hold, much less make a five-year plan. And so with that, the need from the employer side is that you be flexible, you can, you can roll with us, we can work, we can keep refining your job and your job description. The challenge for the leadership is to make sure we're communicating. And of course, all forms of communication, but digital communication skills are of the highest uh, in the highest demand right now. And just in general, and we saw this trend before the pandemic, the essential skills or what we call the soft skills are probably the most important uh, things that, that any job is looking for because they feel they can, if you have the, the technical knowledge, um, you, can't, you need to be able to communicate with your teams, engage with your teams or lead your teams. So all that comes down to there. Yeah, and we did have one one question that I wanted to sneak in um, that was in the chat, and this actually Danielle might be a really good one for you, just since you have a, a broad look at a lot of different employers. Um, was in terms of if there's any wage differences that you're seeing, or if there's conversations about it in terms of uh, remote pos positions versus the traditional office face to face, and if if your employers are looking at that. Um, talking about any, you know, shifting their wages. I know we've seen some some articles about large tech companies in Silicon Valley talking about remote employees may have to take up to a 20% pay cut, as well as survey results showing that employees are willing to take those in order to have the flexibility of a remote or telework position. So is that something that you're seeing at all or having conversations about? We are having conversations about wages. I mean, across the board. Um, employers now that are, are fighting for the talent pool, competing against each other, uh, looking at that, they are looking at wages and benefits, and that's been on an increase. As far as for the remote workers, and many of our employers are small businesses, so they, uh, they aren't looking necessarily or have not been looking at reducing the rate of the remote worker, but from the larger companies that we have, if you were in San Francisco where your cost of living was higher and you were living there, that made a difference. And if you were in Fresno, for instance, working remotely, and there is a lot of discussion um, amongst, amongst the larger companies. I think um, it becomes, as I, I said before, possibly a, a negotiation tool for the employers that are resisting remote work, but needing the talent that is that is then looked at, at a, as a benefit. And it, it's between the, the candidate and the employer at that time as to the value of that remote position. But many, um, I think many businesses are saying uh, they're, if, if it's not a geographic need for the additional money, they will keep it pretty much, much the same. Um, so, but again, I'm speaking more from a small to medium sized business. So those larger businesses have that have been impacted. It'll be interesting to see how that all fleshes out with, with that. I think so too. Uh, Michelle, do I, I see your hand raised? Is that, did you want to add on to this? Yes. Um, Thank you. I just, uh, you know, how I was mentioning how, uh, in insurance and sales, you know, most of the time it's just hundred percent commission, but during COVID they actually changed the pay structure for insurance and, uh, they're doing a uh, salary plus a, a bonus. So um, that's been really interesting too. Not, not for the people that's already started, but for new people just to entice them into coming into trying it out. And then for, you know, the people that have been in the business already, they're doing more bonuses for them. Very so interesting. Really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, so I do want to shift. So another kind of in terms of like benefits and, and needs is there's a lot of discussion around um, equipment. And, you know, we've talked a little bit about some of the collaboration tools that have been implemented, but in terms of if, if employees are working from home, um, who's on the hook for a remote work setup for the software, for internet access, for desks? Um, there's been some pretty big national conversations around um, whether or not employers should cover that and, and what that looks like and how does that fit into a benefits package? Uh, you know, is that a trade-off for paying for commercial office space, that kind of thing. So 
um, I think it'd be interesting to hear a, about that a little bit of so equipment stuff. So um, Nicole, is Breathe California doing anything around uh, helping out with, you know, work from home setups or uh, hybrid office space if you choose to, you know, use like a co-working space or, you know, shift, shifting that around at all? Yeah. Uh, Breathe has been able to provide everything for us except for internet service and phone service and phones. So pretty much everything else, um, desks, uh, equipment, uh, our services that we switch to. Um, we are going to be switching offices soon, downgrading our size, and then we're going to be setting up hot desking situations there. So that's what we've done. Great, thank you. And Sandra, is the County of Sacramento looking at at any of that as part of you know kind of equ equipment procurement and you know making sure that people were set up during the pandemic? And, and is any of that going to stay permanent if you've done it? Um, in general, we have not. It, as part of our policy, the employee is to pr provide the equipment. Um, that said, our office we've um, allowed. Um, some of our staff to check out laptops to take home um, when they've had difficulty uh, with their equipment. Um, they check it out, they take it home and utilize that for, uh, for work. Also, our safety office does help with uh, recommendations on how to set up the office um, to make it ergonomically safe. And, and, um, and technology does uh, provide support, um, um, answers questions. They'll if you bring your laptop in, they'll help you out, um, that kind of thing. But um, we don't purchase equipment. And as an antidote, um, one of my staff got an internship at a local um, technology company. They, they provided her uh, a desk, uh, a laptop, you know, all, all of that um, to help her out. So uh, some companies are doing it locally. Great. Yeah, I think it's it's interesting to see how how that kind of feeds in because it is it's it's you know we think about remote we think about software, um, but there is still a physical aspect to work. You know, we we still have to work somewhere, and so in terms of you know the employee employer kind of support conversations around that, I think are really interesting. Um, Michelle, is there? Yeah, what's what's kind of the standard with with New York Life? Um, so. Uh, so, 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 so it's okay go ahead wrong one i'm sorry uh, so with new york life uh, that we've actually uh, provide laptops um, internet and cell phones for the agents very cool and then so then the remote work setup is is kind of you know where you work and how you work is is up to each individual agent yeah exactly got it great thank you and then daniela are you seeing this as part of the conversations um you're having with your team as well as with the employers in terms of you know what um, <clears throat> if they are going to have a remote work setup, is there a you know a subsidy policy? Is there an equipment procurement policy? What are you yes. hearing? And we we do in fact provide um, for uh, so for our full time fully remote people, they they have the complete office office setup, their laptops. They get fifty percent of their internet. They're provided a phone. All of their office supplies are paid for. For our hybrid. Um, they are provided the laptop um, of an internet allowance, depending on how much they're working remotely and where their home office is, and um, a, a phone and any supplies that they need. And in fact, during the pandemic, we um, taking a look and not knowing what each individual person had. Some people had their own office in and had that room. Other people had to work in a more open space. Um, we were encouraging, you know, that they work uh, in a space that uh, would allow them to have, because they were on the phone, to be, um, have some quiet. So people set up offices in their bedrooms, and we provided um, new office chairs for those who wanted to set up an office for the first time. For our employers, and we do suggest that they have a policy, and that if they're requiring their people to work from home, some of their expenses would need to be covered. And so we, we help them on an individual company basis as to um, what they need to do for their remote people. And I do think it's important that um, not only that employers make sure that you know they, they are thinking about this and are, are implementing policies, but also that employees um, you know, really think about what, what they're gonna need. 
there was, and I can, if anyone's interested, I can find the, the specific study, but there was one, one remote work survey that was done dur specifically during the pandemic. Um, and it was something like 15% of remote workers were literally working in closets in order to find space that was private enough to take a phone call or a Zoom call, um, especially for working parents that had children running in and out of rooms, um, myself included. I definitely have taken, taken a few phone calls in closets in my time. So I think it's it's an interesting piece to um, really make sure is is an active conversation between employees and employers um, uh, as you're looking, especially as as people are trying to join the workforce. And we do have another question um, in the chat. So uh, around is cost savings from kind of downsizing the spaces? I mentioned it, and we heard Nicole. You mentioned that Breathe California is downsizing, um, and is that you know, is that cost being diverted to uh, helping employees with remote work equipment? Um, and then what's the difference between some providing equipment versus those that are not? Um, so I think, yeah, so it looks like the questions, yeah, around like basically what are, what are businesses thinking in terms of if they're gonna have cost savings as a result of lower commercial office space footprint you know, are they diverting that to support or, you know, what's some of the thinking on that? Maybe, Danielle, I see you're, you're nodding your head. Maybe that'd be a good one to start with you. Yeah, it definitely has come up. And um, those that are downsizing or moving to, to smaller, they, they are looking at how they're setting up and, and putting some of that money into their um, remote workforce. And it, it may not be just in equipment. It may be in other benefits uh, uh, and, and uh programs that they put together for their wellness programs and other things. I've seen a lot happening in that area. Um, and uh, most likely the employers are still um, benefiting more because of the reduced costs. And uh, But you have to look at the full picture. There are liability issues that you have to understand. And where does the, the uh, workers comp come into to play and well, how do you how do you promote safety when it's not in your office? So a lot of things have come up from this that uh, we're still kind of analyzing what what the outcome is going to be. Great, thank you. All right, so I think um, at this point, what I'd like to do is to go um, down the line of each panelist, and if there's um, anything uh, on this topic that I either didn't ask you or um, uh, if you'd like to mention. Uh, I'd love to go ahead and do that. And I do have in a, in a private chat one more question. Um, oh, this is, and this is a good one. Um, so, you know, this, this panel has been very focused on the Sacramento region. Um, are employees who are fully remote allowed to move out of the area or even out of state? And this may, you know, this may be a difference between private and public employers. Um, but if you are allowing fully remote, you know, are you allowing your employees or have you seen employees you know migrate as a result of uh remote work and so um let's go ahead and actually start with nicole has anybody on the the breathe california team uh moved and is that is are there any regional restrictions on that um and also you know if, if you're hiring would you be willing to hire someone from out of the region or out of state our team has stayed local. We did actually recently hire three new people, and we did talk about that a lot, whether we would hire someone who lived in the area or wanting to hire someone who didn't live in the area. Um, but we got lucky, I guess. Um, everyone that got hired still works in the area. Um, and since we are still going to be going into the office from time to time, we still kind of wanted someone who lived locally. So. Yep, that makes sense. Uh, Sandra from the County of Sacramento, I would, uh, I'm not gonna make any assumptions, so go ahead and just <laughs> go ahead and answer that question. <laughs> Since we're focused on a hybrid model, um, it, it, uh, I don't know of anyone who has um, moved out of the area and um, in our office specifically, um, no one's working 100% remote presently. So um, they're coming in at, at least once a week um, so um, it would be very difficult with our model. Yes. Yep. Thank you. And then Michelle, I'm going to assume that, I mean, it's, it's pretty much, uh, there's quite a bit of autonomy given that each agent has its own, own book. You, know, you can move freely from region to region. Yeah, you can move freely and, you know, you can choose which office you want to uh, be in and, you know, with being New York life, um, you know, as big as it is all over the country. Yeah. You do have that flexibility. 
Yes, great. And then Daniela, what are you, what are you seeing in terms of uh, kind of the what? geographical mobility of employees? Right. Um, we are seeing. Um, well, we actually have uh, one of our HR directors is has moved out of state. Um, uh, otherwise, they're throughout all of California. Um, many of our employers are um, looking, they're expanding their workforce in this way, but you do have tax issues now that if they're living full time in another state, um, that does change the payroll tax situation that, that each employer uh, is working with, and you have to be reporting that. So um, I think from an employer standpoint, that's the consideration they're gonna have. But for instance, in my case, um, both of our children live in, in Hawaii and I go there sometimes for a month at a time if I, uh, I'm not doing some on-sites and I can work from there and there's no, it's seamless uh, to any of our clients and, and any of, of that. So there's that benefit of um, being able to do that as long as you're not relocating there. Very good. Um, so I think we've touched on a lot of the kind of cost of living adjustments. And there is one question about um, kind of liability and legal challenges. Daniela just mentioned, you know, taxes, you know, if you do relocate to another state, then the employer now may have to contend with um, dealing with employee taxes in multiple states. And I've seen a little bit where there's been some, some companies that will allow you to relocate, but only to certain states based on, on what they're set up to do, especially small employers are going to have a challenge around that. And I think we've also touched a little bit on, um, kind of some of the liability issues around having people work from home versus a corporate office and, and that if there's any other questions for the panel, this is a great time. Go ahead and, and get those into the chat. Otherwise, I'm going to have each uh, panelist go through and see if there's any other points that that you wanted to bring up or mention in terms of kind of the future of remote work and what you think um, this is going to look like in the next one to five years, uh, either for your team or just regionally. Um, I know it's a bit of a broad question, but go ahead and take it as a broad question. So Nicole, let's go ahead and start with you. What do you think uh, remote work is going to do kind of ongoing or if anything else I, I didn't bring up that you wanted to make sure that you included in this discussion? Yeah, so we're going to be continuing this remote work lifestyle, work style. Um, I had mentioned hot desking, so that's something new that we're going to be doing. Um, so we're just going to be continuing that. And in terms of if there's anything else I'd like to add, um, I don't think that there is that hasn't already been said. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Nicole. Sandra? Um, I, I think um, that we've learned a lot from the last 18, 19 months, and um, uh, we probably will make changes. We had... Um, we started with um, a study, one of our departments with social workers because they were out in the field um, and it went very well. It increased um, the recruitment, um, it, it, it uh, increased employee satisfaction and engagement, et cetera. So um, seeing that we have the goal um, with our climate action plan, I, I think that more, more folks, uh, employees will be able to work remotely and I, I, I think there is the possibility of expanding, um, expanding the um, total number of employees with that goal. Um, I don't have anything really to add. Um, I think uh, most um, everything has been said as, as uh, Nicole said. Great, thank you so much, Sandra. Really appreciate it. Uh, Michelle? So uh, my industry is kind of different because um, I guess I forgot to mention this earlier. Uh, during the pandemic, you know, with the pandemic going on, there's like, you know, lots of deaths and stuff. So I guess the opportunity just um, increased a lot. And so that calls for more agents out there um, and people reviewing their retirement needs and plans. So um, ours is actually the opposite. We are actually doing uh, getting a bigger commercial building because we're looking to open pretty soon and, you know, having that 25% capacity starting now. So um, in terms of, you know, getting that space back, um, it's going the opposite direction of most um, industries. Interesting. Great. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Michelle. Yeah. 
Right, Daniela? Um, yeah, I think uh, as we look to the future and realizing this is gonna be the way uh, many, many organizations are gonna work. Um, and, and somebody brought it up in the chat, uh, where's the equity for, for the employees that can't have that? Um, I, I think um, employers are being educated now. And I know we spend a lot of time helping them make this shift so that it is productive for them, that they see the benefits, but also that the employees do. And one thing we, we sort of touched on, but didn't really, is the changes in the, in the onboarding uh, practices uh, for bringing on new people. During, um, during this last year and a half, we have had people that have been hired that never had a face-to-face -face meeting with any of their teams. Um, it, it is a new way of, uh, of interacting and engagement. And this is something that we have to continually master those skills um, with our employers and look at um, how we bring in uh, emotional intelligence into this discussion of when you're looking at a video screen and everything is, is uh, somewhat uh, muted from, from all the body language that you would typically interpret, you're, you're not getting that in this. And um, uh, taking a look at how employees adjust to it. But 100% employees, uh, as you said in the statistics, are looking for this life work balance and remote work works for them in many cases. We just need to take it, it's situational. And I think it's gonna just really change how we lead in the future. Great, thank you, Danielle. And we did have one final question come in. Um, other than onboarding, are there other challenges in managing employees remotely? And I do think we, we talked, I know Danielle, you talked quite a bit about in terms of training managers and um, shifting from, uh, accountability metrics that are based on presenteeism and the, the butts and seats model towards more project based work or, you know, other ways to kind of check in and, and we saw in the survey results that there's, you know, an increase in one on ones and manager check ins. Um, was there anything else besides that in terms of managing employers remotely? Well, it is you hit on I think the most important thing to remember is that feedback loop. The one on ones are more important in, the, in a remote work place where they're in contact with your with their manager, even if it's for a brief period of time that there's a check-in that um, the manager knows uh, where, where the employee is um, and where, if they're oversaturated, if they're not stopping working, um, and to include that personal touch. How are they doing? How can I support you? What did you do this weekend? You know, me, keeping it, so since you're not around a water cooler, what can you do to actually engage each other as you would? Um, and in our case, where our fully remote staff, we only saw them once a quarter, we were having daily meetings during COVID and it became just sort of a, a, a check in wellness, but we also learned so much more about each other personally during that period of time. And being aware that some employees, this was very, very hard. They were alone, where others had way too many people around them. So it was, it, and, and um, so engagement is, is huge in this, in this virtual world. Yep, absolutely. Well, thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate all of our, our panelists. Uh, I think that this, this brought a really great diverse perspective across industry groups, you know, company sizes, public, private. Um, thank you so much for your willingness to, to join me in Valley Vision today. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over. Uh, Renee, am, am I turning it over to you or is it Cornelius is up next? We're gonna have Cornelius uh, next. Great, thank you so much, everyone. So uh, yes, everyone. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping you're enjoying uh, our discussion right now and starting to get a, <clears throat> a feel for the work that, you know, Jamie and I are doing. Um, so a few things uh, I want to discuss with everyone. Uh, first, if you have questions, um, please feel free to email me. Um, I'll send uh, my email at the end of the meeting uh, to everyone when you get in contact with me. Second, uh, we have a white paper that's coming out at the end of September, I believe, right, Jamie? Am I saying correctly? 
Yes, we're good. There. Yes, okay, okay. End of September. Okay, Ooh, okay, we're good there. So yeah, we're working on the white paper, and uh, at the end of September, uh, we're actually going to um, provide that that data in, in in the paper to everyone who wants it. Uh, in addition to that, we are presenting at CCC AOE uh, some of the actual work. Um, not a lot in terms of the curriculum uh, that we're developing in the faculty development workshops, but just an idea of uh, what we're discussing in a little more detail than what we talked about today. Um, well, we're also working uh, on faculty development workshops, as I mentioned before. Uh, something that came up, I'm just going to mention it, uh, but we also have had discussions about how we're going to implement this with contract ed. So we, we, we don't know yet. Um, we're still um, in the beginning phases of this project, but we're just getting a lot of great input and support to continue what we're doing. So um, thank you, thank you. And thanks to Valley Vision too, this has it's been awesome. Thank you, thanks Cornelius. Uh, so we wanna thank everyone for attending today. There's some contact information that you have there. You also have Danielle's um, information uh, in your original email and agenda. So if you have any follow-up information you wanna share or any questions that come up, you can feel uh, free to reach out to any of us and, and we can um, get it to whoever might be able to answer the question. Uh, when, when the report is done that Jamie and Cornelius are working on, um, I think they'll let us distribute it out to you all um, through the registration list. So we'll be doing that. And you'll also see coming out from us in the next um, couple of days, the full recording for this event, as well as the PowerPoint materials. Um, so we'll have those ongoing, and then we will be producing a meeting proceedings report with key findings, um, which will which will come out in about 30 days after the event. Uh, so if there are no other questions, we want to thank you so much for attending. Uh, you, you have been a very um, efficient group answering a lot of questions within the chat and networking together. Um, so we have, give, have the gift of giving you about 15 minutes of your day back, um, which will hopefully give you a much needed break before your next meeting if you're highly scheduled like most of us are these days. So thank you so much for attending today and look for the follow-up meeting materials. And uh, we encourage you to stay connected uh, through our newsletters so that you can be a part of the conversation as it continues to evolve. Thanks so much, everyone.